Green. It's been my favorite color since I was a kid. Um, and this was despite the fact that I grew up in urban places and long before I knew I wanted to be an ecologist. Somehow I just picked green, and to this day I really remain uh, fascinated by the color. So that's sort of where I'd like to begin. It wasn't until high school where I first learned that most of the green on our planet is due to this thing called chlorophyll. And that's what makes leaves appear green. And chlorophyll, most simply defined, is a pigment. Pigments are really interesting things. These are the things that change the appearance of light by selectively absorbing certain wavelengths and rejecting others. Chlorophyll is a pigment that absorbs uh, the wavelengths in red and blue and um, you know, rejects the green. So it's a kind of selective filter that absorbs things that it's not to define what it is. Chlorophyll is different from most other pigments in nature um, because it's considered to be unstable. And by this I don't, I'm not talking about what happens in the fall. So in the fall, um, chlorophyll production stops because of coal. And so other pigments that were always there just suddenly appear. But this is a very natural process that um, is not permanent. I mean, it, the, this green comes back every spring. The instability that I'm talking about is when, for example, uh, extreme heat is applied to chlorophyll and it becomes denatured. So denatured is just a biochemical term to mean that there's some irreversible permanent damage. And this is the reason that we can't use chlorophyll to paint our bedroom walls. The, the pigment that is in, used in green paint is, is an artificially synthesized, uh, inorganic, very stable pigment. Well, there's much more to the color green than just meets the eye. So let's go there for a little bit. The word green comes from the old English word to grow. So just very literally, green means grow. But culturally, it's come to mean so many other things. Green means go. Uh, green is the name given to political movements. Uh, green was the name given to an agricultural revolution that changed the world, the Green Revolution. And it's the American dollar uh, was thought to be chosen to be green because um, green was sort of associated psychologically with the stable and strong credit of the government, the greenback. So green is a very powerful metaphor. It's a metaphor for prosperity, forward movement, for life itself. And so it shouldn't probably surprise us that um, the loss of green um, should invoke all kinds of concern, social, political, scientific, um, and also poetic. And the loss of green is something that comes up, obviously, a lot in uh, my work as an ecologist. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit now. What you're looking at here is a map of the world where the green represents um, what was thought to be forest cover about 8,000 years ago. And this is what remains of intact frontier forest today. So where have all the, these forests gone? Um, well, they've been deforested by humans, um, for humans. And, um, you know, it's this, this process is continuing at a very fast rate, particularly in some areas of the world. Um, and, you know, we need to sort of stop that um, rate of change or slow down that rate of change of loss and certainly conserve what we have left. But what I want to talk about here is the following. When these forests are, are lost due to human activity, um, is that uh, loss uh, permanent? Is there some irreversible damage? Um, are those forests denatured? Or is it possible to regreen, to bring them to some former state? And this concept of regreening is not really new. Um, you know, most logging companies today would not go out and deforest an area without replanting. That's their business. And um, 
you know, but, but at the same time, they are not really concerned about restoring complete ecological function. Um, these are plantations. And so the science, or the scientific study of how to bring back um, ecological function and structure has actually spanned a, a new area of ecology called restoration ecology. And that's the science of repairing damaged landscapes. And it really works on the definition of restore, which is to bring something back to some former state of um, greater aesthetic or scientific function. And it involves sort of what sounds like to be very simple things. Um, you know, choosing what species to plant, uh, how to plant them, how many bringing all the parts of an ecosystem, the members of an ecosystem back together. So literally, it involves remembering. But in practice, it's a very difficult thing to do for several reasons. It involves nostalgia. Uh, sometimes we may not remember what that, those ecosystems really were to begin with, um, or it really just might be too difficult. Um, you know, ecosystems are complex, there's many parts. You know, some would argue that it's impossible to restore ecosystems to some former state. And, you know, they're, they're probably right. So now I want to look at a um, particular example, which is the amazing regreening that has been going on in one particular part of the world, Sudbury, Ontario. Well, most of you, when you hear Sudbury, you're probably not thinking about amazing restoration. You're thinking about the environmental degradation that went on there and rightly so, there was uh, incredible devastation to the landscape that occurred uh, because of past logging and mining activities. And, you know, there is still an imprint of that on the landscape today. However, there, you know, we probably haven't heard of this amazing regreening that has been going on there for several decades now. Uh, millions of trees have been planted, seeds have been sown, the uh, acidic soils have been limed, and there's been dramatic improvements. So this is a photograph taken of an area in 1976. And this is what it looked like in 2001. Some of the things that I'm interested in asking is, what do these novel ecosystems, restored ecosystems, actually represent? You know, is this a successful restoration? Do we stop here? And you have to keep in mind that although this represents a dramatic improvement on um, you know, what was there before, uh, it's still very far away from um, the potential vegetation of this region, the uh, red pine and, and white pine forests that are quite typical of that area. So some of my research involves studying these novel ecosystems and in part trying to help guide future restoration efforts. And um, we do this by comparing areas like this that have been artificially restored to areas that have not as of yet. And sometimes this can be a little difficult. Uh, this is me actually uh, pulling out uh, a jack pine seedling, so behaving very unecologically. Um, because this happened to be a study site where we wanted to see what could come in naturally and, and recover on its own. And um, overnight, one concerned citizen just came into our study site and planted very neatly a row of jack pine seedlings. So, you know, all in the service of science. Um, well, some of the things that we've um, been discovering is that, yes, these areas that have been restored, they have much higher diversity than um, areas that haven't, so higher numbers of species, uh, particularly the plant species. Uh, but when you look a little closer, you see that most of that diversity is due to the appearance of a lot of non-native species, some of which were actually introduced in the restoration program and some that are coming in on their own. And so this sort of, um, and our research also actually suggests that maybe the presence of all of these non-native species is um, preventing some of the native species of the area to come in. So this is where restoration can become a little bit controversial. And um, the city of, of Greater Sudbury has actually started to um, use more native species in their restoration program. Um, but, you know, restoration ecology is a very young science, and um, we're still sort of trying to figure out what are, what are the best ways to restore ecosystems. 
And I think what we can say at the moment is that there are different ways to regreen, and some of them are going to lead to greater ecological stability than others. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to discover. And it's, it is a difficult process and um, very complex, and certainly it's going to be, um, you know, not as simple as just sort of, um, you know, applying a broad stroke of green paint on the landscape. The poet, Czeslaw Milos, had the following to say about remembering. We should not think of our past as definitely settled, for we are not a stone or a tree. My past changes every minute according to the meaning given it now in this moment. And I think this applies perfectly to restoration ecology. And this is where I'm going to introduce uh, the idea of, of metaphor. So um, we, we've heard about all of the, the um, metaphors that uh, green represents. And poetry, too, relies a lot on metaphor. So here now I'm going to suggest a metaphor between chlorophyll and poetry itself. So to do this, I have to tell you that chlorophyll is not just this pigment that um, you know, selectively uh, accepts certain wavelengths and rejects others, but that it is a catalyst for photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is just a fancy word for the um, production of energy from light. And so chlorophyll is this catalyst that is responsible for transforming light into energy. And um, I think that's a very, you know, obviously it's a scientifically important uh, phenomenon, but it, I think it's a very poetic concept as well. And for, you know, what is poetry if not this ca a catalyst for similar types of transformations? Recently, the um, Canadian literary magazine, the Malahat Review, uh, featured an entire issue that was entitled The Green Imagination. And in it, um, there is an interview with the Canadian poet P.K. Page, who sadly passed away last month at the age of 93. And I was very surprised to learn that whenever she had a captive audience, she would talk not about poetry, but about global warming and environmental concerns. This is what she thought was most important at the time. And this was a few decades ago. So she was, I think, you know, as many poets, ahead of her time. Her poem entitled Planet Earth was chosen by the United Nations to foster dialogue uh, between nations and also to be potentially broadcast from the International Space Station. The, um, the poet Jay Rzeski, who um, edited that special issue and interviewed her, has said this, to live in a place you must first imagine it. But um, a pioneer of eco-criticism, Lawrence Bell, has said that the environmental crisis is also a crisis of imagination. And I think this is very true. And scientists, especially those who are working on global ecological changes, do need a lot of imagination. And they need this because of all of the um, dramatic changes that um, global warming is projected to have on landscapes. Um, you know, species are going to be migrating poleward. Um, future landscapes are not going to resemble those in human or ecological history. And so restoration ecologists, you know, facing ecological changes, have this very difficult job of at the same time trying to reinvent the past and also imagine the future. And some of the ideas out there are, are even more controversial than this native, non-native species issue. And one of them is this concept of uh, assisted migration. So assisted migration is this idea that we should be helping species migrate in response to climate change because they're not going to be able to do it fast enough on their own. They're not going to be able to disperse fast enough on their own and otherwise will go extinct. So imagine that. That's a whole new dimension to ecological tinkering. And in the spirit of this of TEDx Waterloo, you know, it's very true that tomorrow started yesterday. But for restoration ecologists facing uh, global ecological changes, it's also true that um, yesterday starts tomorrow and maybe even a few decades into the future.
Well, 2010 uh, happens to be the uh, International Year of Biodiversity, as declared by the United Nations. And the City of Cedar, Greater Sudbury has put out a, um, a new biodiversity action plan. And in it, they quote Einstein. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. And I think statements like this, obviously, they're visionary, they're very poetic, but I think they're also very practical. And this is why I stand here now as a scientist, um, sort of doing the opposite to what P.K. Page was doing, but you know, choosing to defer to the power of poetry and waxing poetic for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. And I'm not alone. Um, there are others who believe that there can be a link between poetry and ecology. Uh, John Felsner last year uh, published this book and asked the question, can uh, poetry save the earth? And you know, he obviously thinks it can, and I think it can too, uh, for the, um, it, the power of metaphor, for its uh, ability to fire the imagination, and for its role in helping us to not just remember but to reinvent um, past states. Um, now I just, um, again, like to come back and, and say that, you know, to, to make that connection, you can try to just think about this concept of green and everything it represents, and this idea of chlorophyll acting as a catalyst for turning uh, light into energy just as poetry may do the same. But this may be some sort of untapped source of energy, um, and uh, that's what fuels us. The poet Rob Robin Sarah has recently written a poem dedicated to light, and she has said that when no more light can get in, when there is no more looking, that is the end. And as a poet and as a, and a scientist, I can tell you that we're, we're, we're not at the end, we're far from the end, and that's because tomorrow started yesterday, and yesterday starts tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>